I'm sitting here underlining all the things in this book here, Revelation for the Rest of Us. I've got Good. tabs and I have some questions. But in talking with a friend last night, I realized that there is a lot of terms thrown out when it comes to Revelation and how people interpret it. Can you tell me what dispensationalism are, is? <laughs> are we on? Uh, are we recording yet? Yeah, we're okay. recording. I would love okay. to hear what is dispensationalism. I, there's just a lot of terms when it comes to yes. prophetic literature, and especially when it comes to talking about ideas about is this about the end of the world? What is dispensationalism? Yeah, yeah and it, it is. It is so true, Amy, that uh, it has its own lore of words and terms and. And people can sling them around, uh, and it, it can get confusing fast. Dispensationalism is an approach to the Bible <clears throat> that classically sort of divided the Bible up in, into describing like seven periods of history, the last, of course, being eternity, okay. kingdom of God. Of course, that's not how they defined it. And one of the big distinctions in classic dispensationalism this explains almost everything. <laughs> okay. And it's, surprise, it's surprising how often it comes up, how rarely it comes up. But once you understand it and see it, you cannot unsee it all the okay. time. And that is that God dealt with Israel until, <clears throat> in a sense, Israel rejects Jesus. And then Jesus turns to the Gentiles or God turns to the Gentiles and we have the church. So God was dealing with Israel, then he dealt with the church, and in the future, through the tribulation, God will deal with Israel again, and the millennium is all about, in this classic understanding, is mm -hmm. all about Jews or Israelites in the people of God. Okay. And then the other distinction is, the Israel is designed for the earthly display of God's glory, and the church is designed for the heavenly display of God's glory. Now, that's not the way a lot of people will define it, but those are the, I think, the big categories that really help explain what's going on. So right now we're in a church age, so Israel is not the focus of God's saving work in the world today. The church is, but it's not that God wants to ignore Israel. God will always bring in Israelites who believe, but then in the future, God will once more resume work with Israel after the rapture where the church is lifted up to a heavenly reality. Okay. So okay. the next time somebody says, just throws out the word dispensationalism, I'm going to not have to pretend that I understand it while I just don't. Say, Israel and then the church. Israel, <laughs> then the church, then Israel. There yes. You go. Thank you for sharing that. I, believe that. I think that the dispensational approach is wrong and wrong-headed. Yeah. Let's and talk about I think that. You talked really about really hurts the book. I think that's a really important thing because I would love to hear, like, is this something that has been, has dispensationalism been something that is been held by the church for a long, long time? Um, and, and, you know, everybody agreed on this and it was like, or, or a very, like, you know, not just in the 60s, 70s. 80s 90s like yes like, okay or, or is it newer and like how does this relate to how you refer to like speculative readings yeah. of the these scriptures all right it is the vast majority of church thinkers you know we're not talking just about lay people yeah but we're talking about theologians and pastors and scholars let's say in the history of the church I never believed dispensationalism, the vast majority. Important. It point. really doesn't arise until now there's a brand new book on this by Daniel Hummel called The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism. Okay. Which is no small pun on Mark Driscoll. <laughs> <laughs> it's having fun with Mark Driscoll, but it was a clever yes. title. Yeah. Uh, just out and I'm I'm talking about it on my sub stack now. Um it really arose in Ireland. Uh Let's say 125, 30 years, 40 years ago. So in the um, in the whole history of church fathers and thinkers, it is really a very new idea. It's very new. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that everything in dispensationalism is as new as that. 
Sure. But, I mean, there have been people who've believed in a rapture and stuff mm-hmm. like that before sure. then. But by and large, there's the system of dispensationalism is mostly a 20th century phenomenon. Yeah. And, um, and it is a peculiar brand of reading the Bible that has a whole lot to do with Americanism mm-hmm. as well. So it's very connected to American politics, uh, though, even though it arose in Ireland, which it didn't have that same politic, but it did have anti uh, Church of England politic in it. And that means anti, you know, Ireland, you know, the uh, not the Republic, but whatever uh, it, it was against certain systems that were connected to politics. But it, when it came to the United States, it morphed into a much stronger political understanding of America and its role in the world, and its place in the world powers, and that we are on the side of Israel, and therefore God's on our side, and therefore God's against those godless Europeans who are forming the so-called European Union. And Amy, here's the funny thing. All these people believed that this was going to happen within a generation after after Israel was reborn as a state in 1948, yeah. and they are all wrong. You mentioned that. I often like, tell my students We're this. still here. Yeah, and that's right. I, I tell my students all the time, what's wrong with dispensationalism is everybody who's done any predicting has been wrong. And that yeah. ought to teach us a big lesson. Yeah, I was just telling, I just interviewed Sarah Billups, who wrote the book Orphaned Believers. Yeah, and, I read her book. Yeah, and she talks about one of the major influences on, you know, white American evangelicalism in the 80s and 90s was this obsession with the end times. And yeah. I had said, I remember my parents getting this book. I think it was like 86 or 87 reasons why Christ is returning. Yes. In yeah. John Walford. John Walford. I looked it up on like Amazon. You can't even really find it anymore. Yeah. It's probably, you probably find one for like a thousand dollars somewhere. 88 reasons, maybe. Yeah. John Walford. Yeah. Yeah. I read that book, Scott. And I was like, oh no, like I need to be ready. And like, and he did, <laughs> and the explanation of like, no one knows the day or time was like, well, we've narrowed it down to three days. Yeah, in that's right. right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> that's so true. Right it's there. one of those three we, days. And I'm not exactly we don't sure. Know, how he... We don't know the day or time, but we're pretty sure we do. <laughs> yes. Um, here's something that you have, you've used a term that I was not familiar with, but I'm sure is something you did not make up. Speculative reading of these of this genre of, of scripture, referring to it as speculative, that is fascinating. So what is the problem with speculative reading of Revelation? Yeah. Yeah, I call it speculation because it's speculation. And here's the, here's the way to summarize this. Some people, the speculators, I call them, read the book of Revelation to see who in the modern world is doing what in the book of revelation mm. so when, that the revelation they have their bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other yes yes you know that's from carl bart who was hardly a speculator yeah. but uh, here's the thing they saw putin invade ukraine mm-hmm. and they wondered if he might be the antichrist now that question right there is the important is a revealing element of the speculation approach it asks the question, who in the modern world, Putin, is doing what in the book of Revelation? Let's say the beast out mm-hmm. of the land. Yeah. Um, he's not the dragon. Okay. The dragon is the, is Satan. All right. So is, is this the Antichrist? Is that sort of thing, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, and I would say this, they fail because they want to know if the book of Revelation is predicting Putin. They could succeed if they would say, does Putin correspond to characteristics of the dragon's empire in the book of Revelation? Yes, in some way. So does China and so does Joseph Biden and so does Donald Trump and so does Barack Obama corresponds to these things when they start using their powers in ways that are corrupting. So instead of predicting someone, the book of Revelation gives us sort of a, a template, an opportunity to discern the presence of Babylon or the way of Rome in the first century, the presence of Babylon, the presence of the dragon, the presence of the wild things or the beasts in our world today. 
and they fail because they make it speculation rather than discernment of political corruption in our world today. Yeah. Um, you talk about, so the, the subtitle of the book is like a prophetic call to follow Jesus as a dissident disciple, as a dissident disciple. And if I haven't read the book, I'm thinking, well, I have seen, I've read Left Behind. And I saw a thief in the night and I'm really confused, Scott, like where does being a dissident disciple come in? And my understanding is that you're arguing for a different reading of revelation. And how does that relate to being a dissident disciple? Yeah. Yeah. I'm offering a a quite different interpretation of that. And this is one of the telltale signs, Amy, of discerning, um, let's say what kind of reading we're talking about when we get into conversation with someone, if they're a speculation type approach, they will not perceive the nature of the Christian life that is taught in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. They will see it as something that has nothing to do with them. Rather, it is something that will occur in the future, in the tribulation, and they will be raptured. Now, some people are post-trib. They have a little bit more difficult time. They realize they're going to go through the difficult times. Uh, they're going to go through the tribulation. I remember I had a friend at one time, and he knew it. He, he was really obsessed with prophecy, and he was very much a speculation, pre-tribber guy, dispensational. And he, he used the terms, and he was good-natured about it. But he'd always say, well, you can go through the tribulation, but I'm not going <laughs> to. Well, For those who are in the speculation approach, the Christian life tends to be minimized in the book of Revelation Mm -hmm. because they see everything is in the future rather than the present. Mm -hmm. For those who approach it uh, as the way I do, uh, and I'm not hardly alone, I'm not alone here. Michael Gorman has written a book very much like this. Lots of people have. Um, I think it is about, it's a manual of discipleship of how to live as a follower of Jesus, who is the lion, who has become the lamb, mm-hmm. how to how to walk in the way of the lamb when the way of Rome or the way of Babylon is the ruling empire of the day. Yeah. So it's sort of like a person who works at a very corrupted business and says, how do I live as a Christian in this world where if I tell the truth, I'll get fired? Or mm-hmm. if I don't, you know, if I uh, don't cook the books, I'll get fired. Or if I don't join in all the parties and all the whatever, then I will lose. My... That's that's sort of what the book of Revelation is, how to live yeah. when the empire is the ruling culture in your environment. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that because, and then I also just want to mention for my listeners, like this isn't just Dr. McKnight saying, I have an idea that maybe this is what it's about. Um, there are a lot of people that have studied Revelation and different genres of literature that are part of our scripture. And so this is not, Scott is not the only one. (laughs) Scott is not the only one who's saying this. And if you read the book, he gives credit and you have a whole reading list. There's a whole of other places for you to get distracted and, and read their work. But I think it is very fascinating that if we get caught up in the dispensationalist um, speculative reading is that it takes a responsibility off of us, really. And you talk about how that really is a failure of discipleship when we, as churches, focus on this, uh, focus on this in this way that is speculative. Talk to me about that discipleship failure. Yeah. Um, Okay. Uh, in the book of revelation yeah. in the in the book of revelation the seven churches of western asia minor modern day turkey some of those cities are lively like smyrna is izmir and that's a huge city today uh ephesus is a smaller city but uh it was the big city in the first century the the whole book is written for those churches all right and um they are they are given, let's say, a roadmap of how to journey in the Roman Empire as followers of Jesus. And I like to say it can be reduced to three W's. Mm -hmm. The big one, the first W 
is to walk in the way of the Lamb. So study the picture of, of Jesus in the book of Revelation. And we are called to follow him. And he, of course, is the lamb who was slaughtered, who was raised, and who will conquer through the word of his mouth and will be the Lord of the new Jerusalem. So that's sort of the journey of the lamb in the book of Revelation. The second W is to be a witness. Mm -hmm. And a witness in the book of Revelation has two major elements. The first, a witness in general is someone who testifies or witnesses to something that they saw or heard. So a witness is someone, let's say, who was outside when the tree fell down. Mm -hmm. And they can come in and say, I was there and I saw the tree land on, on the neighbor's car. Okay, that's a witness. In the first century, they are people who have a testimony, a witness of their own relationship to Jesus. And they were being challenged to, to uh, let's say, use their mouth to become a verbal witness mm. to what they had experienced with Jesus. The second side of the word witness in, in the book of Revelation is that it is an embodied witness. Mm. Their life testifies that they are walking in the way of the Lamb with others who are witnesses. So in the book of Revelation, the word witness is the Greek word martureo or martus. And the word martus uh, sounds close enough that it becomes the word martyr. And so in other words, they embody their in their life a witness to the way of the lamb and they give their life like the lamb at times they die because mm -hmm. they are witnesses. They are they give a testimony of Jesus by their life. So the first W is to walk in the way of the Lamb. That's sort of like two Ws in that first one. I don't know. The word walk is it being ignored. The way of the Lamb. <laughs> witness. And the third is worship. There are a number of songs in the book of Revelation. And scholars kind of dispute how many songs there actually are. And you can get into the weeds about this discussion and probably never get out of the weeds because it's very difficult at times to detect some of these little snippets that might be lines in songs. But there are like eight major songs in the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. or we call them sometimes hymns. And this is, this is a really fascinating part of the book of Revelation that I think is ignored by a lot of people who are reading it, especially by those who are trying to figure out if Putin is the Antichrist. Or, you know, when I was in college, it was Gorbachev because he had a birthmark on his head. And that was the that. mark of the beast. I wasn't in college, but I remember. I remember. Yes. Again. Oh, yes. All right. So um, in, these songs are, remember, these are a beleaguered minority of, of people in Western Asia Minor mm -hmm. okay. under the thumb of the Roman Empire if they begin to act out. And if they begin to resist and not attend events and not participate in the standard civil religion of the first century. So they gather together and they sing these songs. And over and over, these songs are about the sovereignty of God mm -hmm. and that Jesus, the lamb, is the true ruler of the world. So these songs become sort of behind closed door acts of subversion resistance and it makes them dissident disciples of the way of rome in in their personal lives and in their corporate lives as believers in the church so they um these songs are very much and i i learned this from an african-american new testament scholar with a brilliant commentary on revelation named brian blount but he also has a wonderful accessible book uh and it's sort of like mine but his is comes at quite a bit different angles at times it's called can i get a can i have a witness or can i get a witness it's okay. a wonderful little book very readable he taught me in his writing that the book of Re the songs in the book of revelation are like <clears throat> what we used to call negro spirituals which are called spirituals today and they were songs that were acts of subversion 
by the enslaved of America. They sang these songs and their masters thought they were being Christian. And when the doors were closed, they were snickering like we just sabotaged their whole world. And uh, so he taught me this. And I believe that's the best angle I've ever seen on these songs in the book of Revelation. Yes, the believers learn. They learn theology. They worship God in the songs. But these songs carry a message that is resisting the way of Rome. And it is giving them the courage to be dissident disciples who, when their lives or words are on the line before let's say others who don't believe them, don't believe in Jesus, when their lives are on the line, they stand up because they've sung these songs and it's given them a completely different imagination for the world. That I, That's beautiful. I love that. You say in your book, and you know, I, or maybe you were quoting somebody else, but I wrote this down. Um, Revelation is a timeless message, not just for a specific time. Yes. Yes, it's time. Rebel. My um, the publisher Zondervan Reflective, right? Zondervan Reflective mm-hmm. um, for influencers, right? Sent out the book with some stuff inside of it. It was pretty cool stuff, and along with it, they sent out a leather keychain that had on the leather keychain, and I have one. I don't have it in my pocket now. It says Babylon is timeless. Wow. And uh, I just love, I thought, I cannot believe they, that's, that nothing could express the message of the book better than that. Well, um, the book is timely because it spoke in the first century to believers in Western Asia Minor about how to live in the Roman Empire. And it wasn't just Rome. There was a lot of stuff in Ephesus and Laodicea and Smyrna that they had to deal with. But it was timely for them. But because Babylon is so plastic in its meaning and so so uh, so much of a metaphor and an image, it becomes a timeless book. It gives us categories to discern the presence of Babylon in our world today. Yeah. So um I'm I'm amazed by the beauty of the book of Revelation for its capacity to teach you and me how to discern the presence of Babylon in our world yeah. today. Yeah, you talked about in, in your book of, of how you went to see Hamilton and you were looking at a playbill. You know, you wanted to know who all the characters were. There's an explanation of who they are, you know, what their importance is in the story. And you said it's really important when you approach reading a book like Revelation is that you know who the characters are. And so there are a lot of characters in Revelation, so I'm not going to ask you to mention them all, but like, what are some of the main ones and maybe ones that we misunderstand? Yeah. Who that character is. That's true. It is true. We put ourselves into the story of Revelation. Um, You know, an author never stops working. So something (laughs) triggered my my mind when I saw the playbill at Hamilton. Yeah. Um, and I thought, yeah. Well, at the time I'd read Dave Matthewson's book on Revelation and he went through the major actors or something like that, the major mm-hmm. figures. Yeah. And I thought of it, well, it's sort of like a playbill. All right. So I uh, one of my students um, liked an expression that I used and then he started using it all the time. So I captured it. Team Dragon and team lamb are the two are the two sides in the book of revelation and team dragon has babylon the dragon is the is the key thing the dragon is you know is uh is you know has a mission of accusation deceit and death all right also known as satan and the devil the dragon so but it has a different image when you call it the dragon and then there's the wild thing from the sea and the wild thing from the earth. And these are um, embodiments in political power of the dragon's way that is taking root in Rome or Babylon, as mm-hmm. the book of Revelation calls Rome. And then, of course, there is 666, and that's Nero. 
And anybody who tells you otherwise is probably <laughs> needs to stop and think about it more carefully. So Team yeah. Lamb, Team Lamb, of course, has God, the seven spirits, the Lamb, which is Jesus. But it has allegiant witnesses, and these are those who who remain faithful to Jesus in this world. One of the great images on the playbill of Team Lamb is the woman of Revelation chapter 12. And I think that this, um, this illustrates the way we have to learn to read the book of Revelation. People who are more on the speculative side want to know who is this woman. And they want to lock down on a single person. But as you read Revelation 12, and I have I do this with my students. We just read Revelation 12 aloud. And I say, now you just tell me who this sounds like. And it starts out and you go, well, with 12 stars, that sort of sounds like Israel. Yeah, it's, not, it's, it's Israel. Then all of a sudden, this woman gives birth to a son who's going to rule. And you go, that's eh, got to be Mary. All right. It sounds like Mary. It's like an individual person because the individual person didn't uh, leave. And and then the third, by the time that we're done, it sounds like the church. That is the sort of uh, way of reading Revelation is instead of locking down on a single interpretation mm -hmm. yeah. or referent, I think it's wise just to let that text take you where it goes. And if it suggests, this is so imaginative and so full of imagery um, that you can't lock down on single interpretations and think you've got it figured out. It, if, if it sounds like Israel, it probably is. If it yeah. sounds like Mary, it probably is. So why does it have to be one? It's like going to the, to the Broadway play. I think it's Broadway. I don't know. Called Hamilton. <laughs> yes, and saying, yes. what's the basic message? You go... Really? Is that what we're there's, there's well, more than we got, one message, right? Yes, right. There's different characters and what did you see with King George? What did you hear? Well, it was King hilarious. George will be back. He's gonna be back. That's right. That's right. He <laughs> says we'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> you wait and see. And yes. uh, you know, Alexander Hamilton, what does he stand for? Well, that's not the point. Uh they they made use of these characters in American history to make connections to human life and to American history and to current politics and it was it was brilliant but that's what artistic performance does and that's what the book of revelation is it's like a drama yeah it's like uh, it's like fiction and i i tell my students and audiences all the time read the book of revelation the way you read the chronicles of narnia the lord of the rings harry potter though i've never read harry potter where the wild things are by morris sendak yeah. And literature like that. And don't get lost in literal interpretations. Let the story be what it is mm -hmm. and rejoice in the fact that justice is going to come about and the evil empire is going to be defeated. That's that's the message. Yeah. It's not a message about who is doing what in the book of Revelation. So, all right. Yeah. If, if you were going to write <laughs> Revelation for dummies, that's it right there. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Did you ever no, consider here's, that title? Here's the best. Yeah, no, but here's the best title. No, I didn't, because that's actually copyrighted. But here's the probably, best yeah, way of is. describing Revelation for Dummies. I learned it from Randy Harris, who teaches at Abilene Christian University. It is, God's team wins. Choose your team. Don't be stupid. That's Revelation for Dummies. Mic drop. For, what else do we that, need? That, that's right. <laughs> You, I keep being reminded. So I have your book here on the desk, on my desk. But right underneath it, I have this book here. Look at those words: "The Way of the yes. Dragon" or "The Way of the yeah. Lamb." What a nice companion. Yeah. To I've been going through this as a as a as a book club with my some of my listeners and. Is it? No, it's remember. Um, well, it came out two thousand. Came out before everything fell apart in like 2016, yeah. 17, but it's Jamin Gogan and Kyle Strobel. You've read yeah. it where they, they talk to some of the sages in uh, Christendom about people, yeah. people that have chosen the way of the lamb. Um, yeah. And the title is actually comes from something from Eugene Peterson. Um, let me look at it real quick. 
Um, oh, he's got a great book on Revelation. Yeah, where he says, we choose. We follow the dragon and his beasts along the parade route, conspicuous with the worship of splendid images, elaborated in mysterious symbols, fond of statistics, taking on whatever role is necessary to make a good show and get the applause of crowds in order to get access to power and become self-important. Or we follow the lamb along a farmyard route, worshiping the invisible, listening to the foolishness of preaching, practicing a holy life that involves heroically difficult acts that no one will ever notice in order to become simply our eternal selves in an eternal city. Yeah. So that's that's where they got the title from. Yeah. I think we can understand when you say something like team lamb. Hmm. Yeah. 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 That's what we need to be about. And that this time, while this was a letter to specific churches, just like so much else that's in scripture, we then say, what does, what does this mean for how we should live? And you talk about that in your book, like how should we live in light Mm -hmm. of this, that we are learning um, yeah. you say, um, let's see, I had written down something. Um, oh, before we get to that, I want to say, um, a lot of people get, ta- get caught up in millennium yes, yes. <laughs> and what are their pre-millennial, a-millennial, post-millennial, you argue in the book, you say the millennium at best is a sideshow. Tell me about that. Why is that not the big deal? It okay, seems to now, be the big deal in dispensationalists. Yes, in fact, you're right in this sense that a lot of people categorize their personal eschatologies, their eschatology on the millennium. Are they premillennial? And that means that Jesus will return before the millennium. Are they amillennial? And that basically, that's an unfortunate term. Um, that doesn't mean, ah means there is no millennium. Yeah. What they mean is there's no 1,000 year millennium in the future. They believe in a metaphorical yeah. or spiritual, in a sense, millennium that uh, is sort of the church age. And then there's post millennial, which is what Jonathan Edwards and the Puritans were. And that is we will usher in the millennium by Christianizing uh, the, let's say, the nation or the world. Sure. Um, Richard Bauckham is maybe, well, he's definitely in the top five scholars in the world on the book of Revelation. Um, Scottish, he's retired professor, and he's he's brilliant. Richard Bauckham has some sections on the millennium that are just stunningly clear and completely compelling. I don't know when I first encountered what Bauckham said, but I know in, re- in writing this book with Cody, that uh, I reread all of Bauckham's, or his two major books on Revelation. And he said something like this, and this is the way to put it. Almost everything taught today about the millennium is not in the one passage about the millennium in the Bible in Revelation (laughs) chapter 20. And almost everything taught in Revelation 20 is not in what people talk about in the millennium today. So the, the... dispensational approach to the millennium and the post-millennial interpretation of the millennium are fabrications created on the basis of all kinds of passages that have almost nothing to do with what is said actually in Revelation chapter 20. And I think that's very sad. The, the, The struggle is it's very difficult to know in the when this is going to be if it's a predictive prophecy of some kind of 1000 year reign, it just doesn't fit anything that there just has to be like a yeah. huge yeah. silence for a thousand years. And are people going to die? And, yeah. um, and, but I think the dispensational and the post millennial interpretations of the millennium are fabrications based on a series of ideas that don't fit what the Bible actually says about the millennium. Yeah. And it just, so how's that? Oh yeah. yes. It's a side It's show. like an outsized, it's an outsized <laughs> focus when yeah. really you're saying yeah. you look at the whole book and all this is here that it's, it doesn't make sense that all the focus would be there. Um, right. I, I wrote this down. You argue that Babylon is a timeless trope for empires and nations and powers that systematize, systematize injustice, oppress the people of God 
and suppress the truth of liberation. How can we recognize the influence of Babylon all around us? It sounds sort of familiar. Well, yes. And uh, Cody, my grad, my uh, co-author here, he, he has, he did all those charts and I wanted to have something that could be almost movable, but there isn't such a thing for a book. But yeah. if you see, if you have a, a time, uh, let's say a chart with a vertical line and you have a chart with a horizontal line and the horizontal line is, is the history of the world from Jesus till the end. Um, Jesus is on team lamb and he's ruling and at the bottom, he's at the top and at the bottom is team dragon with, with Babylon is its manifestation and new Jerusalem is sort of the manifestation of team lamb. These, the, the vertical line moves through history as we move along. It's always present. The rule of the lamb and the attempts of the dragon to subvert the rule of the lamb are always with us. Babylon is a timeless image for the embodiment of the way of the dragon in the political powers of the day. So that's a thumbnail sketch. Yeah. I wish I had that on. I wish I had that written out because I liked what I just said there. <laughs> well, I've never described got, it quite that. Yeah. So it's, it's just a, if we just imagine and you know, I'm showing you because we have video here. If yeah. you just imagine that uh, that uh, Team Dragon and Team Lamb are moving through history, we can see uh, that they're always present. That's the idea of Babylon. It's a timeless trope of tyranny and oppression. Mm, yeah. There is one thing close to the end of your book that I thought was so powerful. I'm going to read this. You said, the church has lost its voice because it has lost its eschatology. And then he said, if we were preaching or lecturing right now, we'd slow down the pace. This is on page 232. Pausing to grab your attention. And we'd say this to you. We need discipleship. That's what we need. We need political discipleship. That's what we need. Now a third sentence, a little slower and a little lower. What we need is a manifesto for dissident discipleship. What is that, Scott? What is the manifesto? Well, yeah, and I and we I sort of that's the last chapter, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, I would say that the the manifesto is for us to become discipled into what, this sounds like Michael Gorman, a theopolitical discipleship, a discipleship that understands the politics of God in the world, all right? And that is that we are to follow the Lamb, and we are not to follow the way of the dragon. And the way of the dragon is present in every nation in the world, even in the United States. And where it doesn't live up to what God wants the disciple of Jesus needs to discern that and speak against it. So we pray, we fellowship with one another, we discern powers, we resist the powers when they are corrupted and moving against that. We fight against militarism, etc. All these things that characterize Rome in the first century. They are they oppress the truth, they silence voices. All these things are characteristic of Rome in the first century of Babylon. And we need to have a, a kind of discipleship that teaches us to discern this pre as it's present in our world so that we can live in the way of the lamb rather than the way of the dragon. Mm, that's beautiful. I have a really important question for you. Yes. Brace yourself. What's your favorite end times movie? <laughs> you know, I haven't watched one since I was in high school, so Scott, I'm in a little bit of trouble. Yes, you need to I have a movie night. Oh, is there? Are there Left Behind movie? They made the Left Behind books into several movies. Okay. Um, Thief well, in the I Night is seen... a pretty classic one. Pretty classic. Thief, oh yeah, I watched Thief in the Night. Okay. Uh, in in high school i believe maybe i was in college and uh but i haven't seen any of the others 
Um, and those, those movies are all based on speculation yeah. and sort of fear mongering to try to get people to wonder if maybe they're in the last times mm -hmm. and they better shape up or they're going to get left in the tribulation and it's going to be hell for them and they don't want to be there. So they follow, you know, they decide to accept Jesus in their heart. I think that's a, a manipulation of the book of Revelation in the wrong yeah. direction. So, so you don't want to do a movie night with Beef in the Night? Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, I'm telling you, I'm not going to do that. I would, uh, I would put in my earplugs and I would read a book. <laughs> well, I am so thankful for your time. This has been yes. a wonderful conversation. I encourage everyone to pick up Scott's new book. It is so, it's so good. If you have a pro, if you have been like just sort of disenchanted with ideas of looking at revelation i just want to ask you to try again maybe yes. with a less speculative approach this yeah. this book really is revelation for the rest of us those of us that really want to grapple with it in a way that doesn't make us feel like we're just trying to escape and make sure we have checked off the box that we are on the right side that gets whisked away That's and right. aren't here for uh all of the guillotines and whatnot that have been uh, speculated so about in media for some time. So thank you, Scott. I really appreciate well, this. Thank you. I'm you're so right stop. about if you're, if people are kind of scared off by the book of revelation, this is a completely, this is what my yeah. students who were scared off have said, this is so fun. I'm really glad to do this. I didn't know there was another way to read the book. So yeah. 